Okay, I can see we've got quite a few people in now. So um, <clears throat> I might just kick off with the introduction and um, see if people join uh, whilst we're on the go. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for um, joining us today. Um, and thank you very much to XB Schools Trust um, who are hosting this uh, spotlight, um, virtual spotlight, uh, in, in these challenging times for all of us. Um, my name is Tim Johnson. I'm a, a program manager for the delivery services for NSN. Um, and on the call, of course, we have uh, XP Trust as well as some NSN colleagues who will be taking notes um, and dealing with follow up. Um, there's also Hannah Jackson, who's the head of advisory services, who's on the call. Um, she is technically chairing this meeting, but due to internet problems, I've just taken over for the time being. So she might jump in uh, a little bit later on, just to let you know. Um, so we're really pleased to host um, our first virtual spotlight. Um, and of course, you might be aware that these are usually held in open free schools um, as a way of seeing best practices in action. Um, of course, we're moving us to a virtual platform in the current circumstances, um, but I hope uh, that this will be able to show you um, how some free schools have been tackling uh, COVID-related um, challenges quite innovatively um, in the current uh, climate. Um, I'll let XP introduce themselves. I'm sure they can do a much better job, but just a quick overview. Um, they started off as a secondary free school uh, in Doncaster, inspired by High Tech High, um, and they have a real focus on beautiful work and expeditionary learning. Um, which is what uh, I think they'll be focusing on today um, and how they've sort of adapted that. Uh, the school is now outstanding um, with another free school and potentially one more on the way. I and mean, primary schools have also joined the trust since. Um, so before I let them take over, um, just a couple of housekeeping remarks. Um, we will be recording the session, um, so just to bear that in mind, uh, we'll be sharing that later. Um, and just to be aware whilst the session is going on, um, we are joined by colleagues from the Department for Education. Um, they are here to listen and observe. Um, and also in terms of questions, um, this session is broken into four smaller sessions with different topics. Um, we're going to allow a bit of pause um, after each of these four sessions throughout the time we have. Um, so please do make use of the chat bar for questions and they'll be answered within, within those intermissions. Um, that's all from me. Um, I'll hand over now to uh, Martin. I think, I think oh, Neil was oh sorry, start. sorry to Neil. <laughs> no problem, Tim. Thank you. Welcome, colleagues, and uh, thank you for having us. Um, it's our first uh, spotlight uh, online, so uh, we're all looking forward to this. So, yeah, just to talk a little bit kind of about the XP Trust. Um, it was uh, started by um, uh, on a free school, on, as, as free schools. So we XP a free school and XP East as, as a free school. Then we were joined by um, a primary school in Thorn within Doncaster called Greentop. Uh, and this time last year, when, when we looked at all our slides, we were three schools. Um, since then, we have added three more primary schools. Um, also, we have uh, hopefully a free school uh, project ready to be signed off uh, and another uh, primary school hoping to join the, school, uh, join the trust. So actually, in a very short period of time, um, we've, we've, we've grown the trust uh, to where it is now. Um, and we're just going to talk a little bit kind of how uh, through, through the, our belief system of, of developing beautiful work, bringing the community together as a, as a crew uh, and so we can achieve academic progress, how we've, how we've led our, our set of schools through this um, incredibly challenging and difficult situation for us all. And, and this is where we, I need Martin to go. Press the next slide, Martin, please. Cool. So today, today's journey is, um, is, is explaining how we created a strategy, we try to give hope, we try to give direction. And if you can remember back to the beginning of March or mid-March, it was a bit crazy, wasn't it? You know, every, everything was a little bit up in the air, to say the least. Um, so we're going to talk about the strategy, we're going to talk about how we created new norms, how we then develop, delivered our online expedition, our curriculum online, and then at the end talk through uh, what we believe the impact has been so far. We're also going to kind of talk and pause about uh, and allowing you guys uh, questions to uh, to be answered or anything that you that you wish. So we will build that into our presentation. Okay, so I think when when we this all started, I think it was the eleventh or twelfth of March when uh, the, the rumblings that things things were were going to be different. Um, the executive team got together 
uh, to decide, you know, how we would tackle this. And like everything, we tried to make it really simple that what we wanted was a, with a, a strap line to begin with, just to hold out all our staff across the trust and our parents and our children and students to kind of, to know that, you know, we, we were on it, you know, and, and to give them an idea of, of what was most important. Because I think at some points, you know, there was obviously teachers got their own ideas, parents have got their own ideas, the government had their own ideas. Um, you know, kids were, you know, as, as young as three um, uh, in, in the middle of all of this. So we tried to give a really simple, uh, a simple phrase to, uh, to hold people to, uh, to account really. And, and that phrase, Martin, thank you, was. Uh, so our noble mission was to open our schools for as long as possible, keeping all our students safe and to ensure our curriculum is online for all students and families. And we did have in every school this message with brackets and wash your hands. Um, that was that was a big push, certainly for the secondary school kids. So um, what we, what we had to do was was this this gave us a little bit of time to to then develop a strategy of what this looks like. So uh, we didn't know how long this is before lockdown, by the way. So we didn't know how long the schools would be open for. Um, we didn't know whether they were going to close. But what we didn't did know to focus on was that we have a narrative success in our trust. And it starts off with all children being safe. So what our most important thing was to develop that safety. So we met in our, in our um, new title Kingfisher meeting. Um, so the government have Cobra, the XP Trust has Kingfisher. Um, so we, we met in our Kingfisher meeting and we then made sure that we had we developed a strategy. Thanks, Martin. Um, so in, in that strategy meeting, um, we, we have four executives but then we, we invited all our head teachers through. We have our trust senko and our lead safeguarding. And we developed a strategy, first of all, to make sure that we have uh, a, a really specific, close um, procedure for keeping our vulnerable children safe. Uh, across the trust, we have around about 45% uh, children who would be deemed disadvantaged. Um, we have a get, a, around about 32% children who are SEN and again 10% who receive EHCs so actually we, we've got high vulnerability and our first thought was how do we keep those guys safe how do we create check-ins so the trust senko and the safeguarding lead for the trust work together work across all the schools to create a very precise check-in process where crew leaders which, which we call our class teachers or, or form tutors would have would have the accountability of connecting with their children and their students uh, so many times a week. We then would keep uh, an eye on that uh, with, with, with um, using the IT to kind of have checklists to make sure that our leaders were holding those true leads to account. And that was number one about keeping, keeping our children safe. Thanks, Martin. So yeah, so in this meeting, in this Kingfisher meeting, you can see it was the 19th of March, um, we created a, a, a trust, a, a website, so everything that we that we thought we our heads and uh, leaders would need to know was on this on the website. So COVID nineteen trust support. So that website was quickly put on there because what we realised is that we needed to, to to make sure that we need to give our head teachers capacity to lead their schools. Um, you know, we we could kind of deal with an awful lot of the uh, the noise that was coming, and, and we, if we could give that to our head teachers in, in a uh, in, in a really simple form that they could digest and then pass out to their staff. That would help them lead the way. Um, so yeah, that plan there was incredibly thorough. Um, I think four or five pages long. Um, and each member of the executive team took a lead on, uh, on different areas. Um, I remember that at one point I got the role of uh, sorting out uh, school meals. Um, now I know everything about school meals and free school meals and working with the kitchens in the local authority and, and private providers what you know working with asda and, and aldi and all the different voucher systems but again by me doing that that took away the pressure of the head teachers to kind of um to do that and they could lead their schools and they could lead their organizations so we came we came to a point where we had lots lots of plans going on um but still after that march the 19th we then obviously came into um into into the lockdown position and again it was about what do we do with our schools and our leaders and, and our community? And because a lot of them, they needed hope, they needed direction. We are the centre of our communities. We are the centre of many of our, of our young people's lives. 
what we had to make sure is that we gave them um, some hope that we will see each other, you know, what that would be look like and some clarification of what, what we're not going to leave them. Um, so again, you know, through, through, through design, through working together, we created what we thought was a really simple, um, well color coded system. Um, and it is on the next page. Not that way, that way. Ah, okay, so, so yeah, so we kind of created a, uh, I think you've seen these colors since. Um, but yeah, so what we did, we, we created um, a strategy to hopefully guide the way forward to where we would, where we would be um, in the future. Our, our head teachers have got miles and miles of plans under each phase. But obviously, if, as we take into phase one, we were going into that pre-closure um, period. And our, our biggest plans there were to get our safeguarding plans online. As, uh, sorry make our safeguarding plans in place regarding the check-ins as I've spoken about. And then a really big focus was getting our curriculum online. Uh, and I think Martin will probably say, you know, we've, we've been trying to get our curriculum online for, for all year. This just, just gave us a massive big shove to make sure it happened. Um, and Martin will, will talk more about um, that period in a minute. Um, so once we kind of got our curriculum online and our, and our staff were really kind of, um, you know, educated and upskilled in CPD, we then we could move on to the next section, which was uh, uh, introducing the new norms to our um, to our students, to our young people, and our families. Uh, and that included, as I put there, you know, free school meals and school lunches was a really big deal back in uh, late March. Um, so you know, one one of the big things there was how do we feed our kids uh, who normally come to school with a free school meal? Um, so we kind of worked on a, a lot of that about that. The head teachers then worked on team rotors. And we were able to manage to kind of to ensure that we had uh, staff in the, in the school buildings because our schools never closed. Um, also staff online who were, were able to kind of work with the children uh, and the young people. But then we realised as well, because this is just about around Easter, we had to factor in Easter holidays for our staff. And one of, our, one of the biggest things I'm really proud of is that we did. So we factored in that staff had holidays. Um, so the head teachers worked really well with that, with making those rotors so that the staff actually got time off and had a break. Not that they could do anything, mind, but you know they just didn't have to go online for uh, for full days like the rest of us. And then phase three, that was Easter, you know. And again, we've all got different Easter holidays, um, so we we made sure that we had you know our safety checks on board. Uh, our school teams were in place. Uh, our distant learning teams, we gave them e Easter holiday. Uh, projects um, certainly with the younger ones uh, and we had holiday teams again just to make sure that we were keeping children safe um, and the holiday checks kept carried on as normal and then really phase four was all about expedition hence why it's called that and we want, really wanted to kind of get our um, new expeditions launched uh, now we kind of had the skill to develop um, um, a more online curriculum so our, our staff had had four, three or four weeks of kind of understanding the Google Classroom, uh, being able to post, being able to blog, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of our schools actually went from no website to, a, to Google uh, Classroom use in seven weeks. Um, I think you know, they get a gold star for, for taking on, on board as much IT as humanly possible. Um, but yes, yeah, so then we started looking at pupil engagement and you know, Clara will talk a little bit about how we engage our pupils, not just with academic, um, expedition but also how we how we managed to kind of keep the uh, the spirits high if you like um, and then we moved into what we are currently what we think we're currently in phase five which is that transition so the transition into the in, into the trust for new staff transition into the trust for new kids but also on a, on a larger larger scale transitioning back to some sort of normality um, obviously schools across the country uh, in different parts of the country some some have all gone back in terms of reception year one, year six, year 10, year, year 12. Um, you know, in Doncaster, I was just saying before, we had a, a slight stall where the, um, the mayor of Doncaster got involved with, um, with public health as well. So we've kind of had some political challenge as well to get involved in, which again, um, we, we've done by open dialogue. So we all, I think that by next Monday, we'll be opening up a, a, the wider offer as, as the government requested. Um, I know Clara's school has 
and the key workers there have gone from 20 to 30 now over you know over 80 80 children just for key workers and vulnerable kids so next week she'll have well anything over 150 in in her building uh, so again the challenge so the f- phase five is it was all about kind of organization and again giving hope that you know we will get back to normal and then you know phase six as it says there the reopen the celebration we're hoping that's going to be the new academic year but again we're all planning different different phases for that so that was kind of that was that was a strategy that we hope would give our staff back in on march the the 20th or whenever it came out hope that again the executive team knew exactly kind of the pathway we didn't have dates all we knew about that easter would come um but we, we had to make sure that our heads and, and our and our schools would move systematically through this through these challenges and had some had some things to focus on okay so i'm just going to pause now guys and, and, and look at the chat to see if, if 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 there are any questions I don't see any questions. Tim, do you see any questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, I think uh, based on the agenda, we can we can move forward. But um, I do urge attendees, if you do have any questions, just to drop them in the chat cool. uh, as we go on. Especially now because Martin's on the next section. So write loads of questions for Martin. That'd be great. Okay. Martin, over to you, dude. Um, so I remember standing in front of our staff on March the 17th, I think, in the secondary schools. Um, and I just had a call that day saying that my son was coughing and he hadn't stopped coughing. And I was like, oh, crikey, I'm, I'm going to be home for two weeks now. Uh, and, and really, we needed to accelerate plans in terms of upskilling staff, um, in terms of digital learning, because we knew it was coming. Um, but more importantly, you know, we really, really believe that simple input is what allows complex outputs. Um, so we sat and had a think. And, and really, in terms of the online platforms that we chose to use um, to get our curriculum online and to get kids able to access and to learn, um, we, we just came up with three really simple principles. The first of which was we put our curriculum online as much as possible and we use Google Sites to do that. We were already a G Suite school, so that was you know within our capability to do that across the cr- trust. So Google Sites is where we put our stuff. And then we said, well, we'll, we'll communicate with students through Google Classroom. So Google Classroom, that's where we tell kids what to do. And then Thirdly and finally, we used then the integrated Google Chat and Google Hangouts to have kind of um, live conversations with students to be able to then have crew leaders be able to run crew sessions, for example. Um, and that really, I think at that point, along with the strategy which we, which we were publishing, gave staff the comfort that, right, okay, I can deal with that. Those three things are really clear, really simple. Um, and so it was then upon us to start laying the groundwork. So what we did for parents is we put together a parent support center. Many of the things had been happening anyway. Google Classroom was already kind of ubiquitous in the secondary schools, but not so much in the primary schools. But we just tried to put everything in one place for parents. So we wrote a narrative of what learning we expected it to look like. Uh, and we put everything there on a parent support center. Um, I will, um, after this, I'll, I'll give the links to all of these to the New Schools Network people and then they'll hopefully be able to pass those on to you um, in addition to the, the recording in these slides. Um, so we put a parent support centre together, including importantly things like a- advice from Public Health Doncaster on mental health, advice on things in terms of structuring for kids and, and timetables, ways to communicate with the school and get in touch with us because it was clear that the admin office was going to be closed. So if you need a laptop, Here's how you do it. Here's you get, how you get in t- touch with us if, if, if you haven't got your vouchers for free school meals. So all of that was put in place. But just as importantly, we needed to lay the groundwork for staff. Um, so we had a kind of daily update doc which went out to staff um, from the first instance. But the biggest driver really for me, and this was the work that I and the ed tech team that we, we put together was um, a, a kind of a, a body of CPD resources primarily for the, the internet-based resources that we were using, um, that if, if took a load of the G Suite resources and just put them into our context. Um, and we're really, again, you know, one of our principles is if it, it, we have a design principle of teachers as learners, what's good for the kids is good for us. One of the reasons that we, we were trying to put our curriculum online up to this point anyway, is that we really don't want to be the gatekeepers of knowledge for students. It shouldn't be the case that kids need to come to a lesson and then have a teacher give them direct instruction or do a protocol based lesson. And that's the only way they can interact with our curriculum. So we are already, I would say, you know, 30% of the way to where we are now in terms of getting the curriculum online. 
But in the same manner, what we wanted to do is just put all of this online. So from kind of March the 18th, when I was at home, we put together an ed tech team and then we just made a load of resources for staff in terms of upskilling them in classroom in Google sites, how to use Gmail more effectively, how to use things like screen flow to do screen recordings, because what we weren't able to do, um, I'm in my sitting room right now because my wife's upstairs teaching online. She works in a private school and you know, those parents have got a financial investment in this school. And so all of her kids turn up to those lessons. We've got some families with no laptops between five kids. We couldn't ask our families to run a regular timetable. Um, and actually we stripped it back in the second week of online learning and, and realized that it, we were asking too much of our families. So we had to provide a means of learning where kids could access where and when it was convenient for them. And that needed um, upskilling of staff. But as I say, what, what was a, a real turning point was when staff became more uh, better versed in terms of doing online delivery through recording instructional videos and then posting those online so effectively. You know, you'll have seen the Oak Academy stuff. A lot of our learning looks now exactly like that. Um, and it's great that that's up there, but in our context, learning through learning expeditions, we needed to make it bespoke for our context because the learning sits in a context which is being studied through those learning explorations or expeditions. So again, I, I'll, I'll get the link sent to New School Networks here, we'll see everything that's on there, but it's quite extensive. The other thing I just wanted to add on that is, the other thing which we planned was for myself and some of the other members of the team to have capacity to run online workshops for our staff so they could check in and have kind of a, a, an hour's worth of training on Google Classroom. What we found was, and I think this is testament to the, you know, the, the spirit within the trust, I spoke with the heads on a Friday afternoon one week and said, I'm really worried nobody's turning up to these workshops. I said, don't worry, Martin, what's happening is everybody's just mucking in. What's happening is those people who are in school are showing each other while they're in school. Those people who aren't having hangouts with each other to train each other up. Um, and there was a really from, you know, bootstrap, from the bottom up, groundswell movement of everybody helping each other to get trained up in that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, really proud of that because, you know, what happened was remarkable. The distance that some teachers have gone in terms of their online learning, it's just been fantastic. Um, so we put out a survey in terms of where staff wanted help. And that's where we focused initially on providing that CPD online. Uh, and it was, you know, it was no surprise that it was in Google Classroom for communicating with kids. It was on they needed help on how to make uh, screen recordings for kids. And also what came out of that was we've, we've got access to a fabulous program called ClickView. There's a lot of people who want the training in that because it's, it's an online repository. It's, it's basically YouTube for learning without all the nasty comments below the line uh, and it's curated. So you know the quality of the content that you're getting as well. Um, so there was a massive body of work that went into that initially, but what that allowed us to do then in the same way that the, you know, at a trust level, we made sure that heads could do their job we put that energy in in the first instance so teachers could do their job and have everything that they needed at their fingertips in one place not just the daily updates but that online cpd as well so if there are any questions on that section i don't quite know because i'm presenting i don't want to break it how to look at the chat so i don't know Tim, if you're able to tell me if there's any questions in there uh, no question oh we just got a question in um so alex asks for schools without an online presence um, where would you say is a good place to start? I think you need to be really clear in terms of your network and the type of computers that you've got. You know, if you're running PCs, then it's most likely that a, a Microsoft suite, and I know the government and the DFE had put in um, support and funding available for, staff, for, for schools to access that. Um, you know, my best guess at the moment is if there's social distancing still in September, there's going to be some element of distance learning. So for schools, who are not anywhere near this position, look at your platform, talk to your network manager and work out, is it best for us to go with Google Suite? Is it best for us to go with Microsoft? Is there another provider that we can use? And then as we did, I think you just need real clarity on simple inputs and using just a few platforms. You know, Teams, for example, my son's on that right now. There are all sorts of apps that you can use in, within Teams, but for us, it was just those really clear three things. Google Sites, we'll stick our stuff on there, and it's very intuitive, as we've seen from staff who've never used it previously now using it. Google Classrooms, where we communicate with um, kids what we want them to do and set assignments. And then if we need to, we can use Google Chat and Google Meet to talk to them. Um, so I think have a really clear plan in terms of what you want to do with your students and, and look at which platforms and don't try and to do too, too much at once. But I think the really important part is talking to your network managers and working out 
Is it Microsoft that we need to go with? Is it Google or there other providers that we can use? Um, and as I say, you know, th there are lots and lots of resources out there that exist already to train staff up in that. Neil, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, just build it on that. So, for, so, so from a, some of our primary schools who, who didn't have any online presence and they didn't have a website, but what they did have was, uh, was Class Dojo, for example. So what we, what we encouraged our, our head teachers to do was to explore what they already had and, and to look about how, they could, how they're already communicating with their, with their, with their families. Um, so, you know, be it text, be it email. So I think one of the things is, um, is just to explore all the different ways that you currently will have in your schools, um, a way in which you push learning out which sometimes you just you just take for granted you have that. Absolutely, thank you. And we've just got another question in um, as well. Um, how did you help to ensure that all families had access to um, computers and the internet? Um, in our context, I think again, we were starting from a, a strong position to start with um, because we were already running Google Classroom in the second, secondary certainly um, one of the things that we do is track which students have got devices and get on the case about bringing them to school and bringing them charged. So not, we're not providing them with school devices during the day when they don't need to. Um, but because we had those lines of communication, I, I'm speaking from a secondary perspective, Claire I might want to add something from a, a primary perspective here. Because we had those lines of communication open and because we were tracking through crew leaders, and I'll talk more about that in a second, um, we were in a position where we knew who was likely to struggle with access and we had a protocol put in place fairly early on for if you contact the school we'll get an agreement um, and, and we were just using Chromebooks at the time um, we're looking at iPods now as a, as a, as a possible option because um, their costs reduced dramatically um, but for what we needed the students to do and being a Google Suite school Chromebooks were ideal so we had the capacity there in terms of the systems for tracking who was getting the work done who had devices and who didn't to be able to get laptops out to, to parents fairly quickly. Um, in terms of just that piece on crew leaders, certainly in the secondaries, our pastoral structure is, is massively important and I'll come back to it later in the presentation, but as a crew leader, you look after 13 kids uh, and effectively you're a head teacher of their school. You're a head teacher of 13 kids uh, and we know our families really, really well. And that was one of the things that struck me from visiting High Tech High was, took me three days of being confounded to realize this is a primary school for big kids. These teachers have got the same relationship with the parents and with the kids that they do in a primary school, but just with that added, you know, six, seven, eight years maturity. Um, so we, we know our families really, really well. Uh, and, and that's been really invaluable to us in terms of, as we'll talk about the impact later, the increased engagement has come, not just as a result of putting the curriculum online, but of crew leaders knowing their families and their parents really, really well. And what allows us to do that in the secondary um, context is our teaching assistants, we call them learning coaches, but many of our learning coaches, most learning coaches, in fact, are crew leaders. And they're some of our best crew leaders. Um, and that's had a massive impact because they've been able to look in their 13 students and go, I've got these four who are really struggling and devote most of their week to those four kids because that's where the attention's been needed. And, uh, and a follow-up question, I think, which is quite relevant to that, um, is um, how have you addressed those students who have not engaged online? Have you provided internet for families as well as devices where required? Uh, yes, is the simple answer to that. And we'll talk about impact and how engagement's changed over the, the period of closure later in the expedition. But yeah, absolutely. That we've provided that we've provided devices, and then we've provided one-to-one -one support via you know platforms like Zoom, but we use Google Meet. Is there anything you wanted to add to that from in terms of devices for primary? I think I could just build on it slightly in the fact that um, because the Google Suite allows them to use it on so many different devices, lots of our parents and families found a workaround. So they use the Xbox to log in and find what the work was. And a lot of our younger students are then sending photographs in by email of the work they've completed in an exercise book. Um, a lot of our parents, particularly sort of year two, three parents, were pushing back that they wanted them to handwrite. So they were accessing what the learning was on our home learning platform, on a phone or a, a tablet that they got at home, working and then sending photographs in and doing it that way. So we sort of found workarounds for them all to access what was available to them online, but in a way that worked for them as a family because we all know that lots of those families that are working at home have also got parents working at home and trying to find ways of using one device across the family. 
um, had its issues as well. So we just, it's case by case, like Martin said, and because we know our families so well and we've got those relationships with our families, we could judge which ones needed to borrow a Chromebook for a period of time, which ones could use devices at home, which ones just needed a phone call maybe every week to talk through what was on there so that they could access it. Um, and because of those relationships, we were able to do that. Yeah. And wh where that hasn't worked, there's then been the option of bringing the students in to work alongside you know, those vulnerable students and the key workers. And that has happened in, in both primary and secondary where we've, we've, we've brought kids in in addition to the offer that we had. Thank you very much. That's all the questions at the moment. So in terms of the next stage, which is, you know, it was our kind of last phase in that, in that trust strategy was relaunching expeditions after Easter. I mean, you know, as an anecdote from my perspective, the work that I was doing on putting all of our resources online for staff and making sure that staff were able to do that, you know, I'll hold my hands up and say the work I was setting for my kids that I teach was tidying them over until Easter. Um, what we were then able to do, though, was set a clear date where, you know, we, we really believe that it's really important that kids have these visceral learning experiences. And for those who don't know our context, we, our kids learn through cross-curricular learning expeditions in secondary and for part of the year in primary, where there would traditionally be topic, we do kind of topic plus and call it learning explorations, where kids are producing work that is beyond what they imagine they could produce in terms of how beautiful it is. And it has a public, authentic audience at the end of it. Um, and, and those are the real drivers for our curriculum. We still do the national curriculum. We still deliver GCSEs by the time the kids get there. Kids still sit SATs and do very well in year six. Um, it's just that this is, you know, one of our levers for engagement. And I mean engagement in the truest sense of the word. I know it became a bit of a weasel word in education, but for me, you know, there's a really good continuum of engagement by Dorothy Heathcote, who um, was a, a proponent of Mantle the Expert and she talked about it you know where you want get kids to get is not just attention but investment and that's why we do learning expeditions and learning explorations because we want our kids to care about the work that we do not just not because it's always relevant because it's not we take kids beyond their context but because it's important and we want kids to know that they're important and the work that they do is important that was a massive driver for us and that's why we ex expended all that energy in the initial stages of knowing how to put the curriculum online so we could go back to focusing on the nature of our curriculum and not just where it lived. So Clara, do you, do you want to talk a little bit first about the kind of primary setting and, and websites? Yeah, so um, a big thing for us was that we always hook our learners into our new expeditions and how we were going to do that while most of them were at home. Um, so we, um, up until sort of close year, we were populating our um, Google sites for expeditions sort of retrospectively as we've done something and we've revolutionized that in the term of sort of a week at a time we are populating in advance so that we're no longer gatekeeping any of that and it's much more that children can access anything from home in advance of, of the experience and um, the sites just provide that extra learning they provide that place where all the video content is stored they provide slides for um sort of instructional teaching um, and from a primary point of view, it was more about ensuring that everyone could access that early on um, and in the pre sort of stage, ensuring that that wasn't a, a difficult thing for people to access. And then from the week beginning, I want to say 26th of March, 27th of March, we were able to launch our new expeditions um, and we've got two very high energy expeditions, videos and being curated, websites being curated by teams of students currently that will be launched as a celebration towards the end of the term. So having that website as sort of a host page um, really helps our children to have the access to what they need. Yeah, and, and, and from a secondary perspective, you know, where, where we had got kids who were struggling with engagement and, you know, were disorganised, what that allowed us to do with those hook weeks and those immersion weeks is, you know, where we had a brilliant response was th th this expedition here where I'm teaching um, looking case studies about the night jar in at Hatfield Moor, which sadly has had a, a fire recently, you know, we were able to say for a week, you know, which is what we would do anyway during immersion, is not introduce any formal learning targets, but say, go out bird watching, learn about bird song, go build a bug hotel in your back garden and hook kids into that learning. And we went from in year nine, in my case, uh, where we'd been setting this work, tied them over, 50% of kids regularly kind of getting the work in to 
85% turning up to a Google Hangout to launch the expedition because they wanted to show the bunk hotels that they've been building, the nest boxes that they've been making. And, we, and again, we've kind of arrived at this. Let's try and keep it really simple. So this is an example. And again, it looks very similar to the Oak Academy, uh, the National Oak Academy stuff. But it's an example of some instructional videos that have been made, some quizzes to, oops, pardon me, some quizzes to check learning. But what that allows us to do, because it's simple and because the kids have a structure which they like and they can return to, it means that we can place it in that wider context of, we're not just studying about cells, we're learning this because we need to know about the respiratory system of a night jar. And actually, you know, in, in a kind of perverse way, that this fire has brought it to the, the fore even more because they're, they're in real trouble, the night jars there from, from all I can hear. So it makes that learning really real, but it's given us structures. In the time before expeditions, we were finding in the secondary session that things like Hegarty Maths were being done really well because it was comfortable and the kids were used to it and it was a format that we were familiar with. So having this as a kind of uniform structure across the site has really helped us in terms of having kids be comfortable that when I'm sitting to down, do work for STEAM or I'm sitting down to do English work, I know what that looks like, I know where to go uh, and that's had a massive impact on, on engagement as well. So I think we've yeah, talked so, about that a little bit. Do you want to yeah, say any more about that, Claire? Um, I think really it was more about in the immersion weeks getting all our families excited about what we were going to be learning to reinstate that um, engagement and I'll talk a little bit more about engagement later on and how we sort of dripped things in um, to engage students more at different points. I think an important purpose in immersion as well, whilst we don't introduce any formal learning targets, you know if you're in year seven and there's an expedition where the content is starting to touch on going beyond the particle model and atoms, elements and compounds, there are many families who would never have discussed those words before in their household. And the immersion is, it's the part of the purpose of those immersion weeks is it's a, it's, it's a point of social equity so that when we do come to start to study those learning targets proper, every kid has something to contribute because they've taken part in these immersion activities. So for example, here in, in my expedition, we're introducing kids to the idea of mitochondria. They'd only learned about organelles previously. So we had them on Zooniverse doing citizen science projects where they were drawing around the outline of mitochondria, but that was helping train AI bots to be able to spot mitochondria properly. And it means that kids all week are talking about mitochondria and knowing what they do. In week two, they then come in when we introduce learning targets about mitochondria, a kid who is free school meals, EHCP is able to contribute to that where they wouldn't have previously. I think that's a really, really important part of immersion, not just in terms of this point in time, but at any point in time when schools are open even. Um, so I think to sort of bring the curriculum to life in the planning stages, historically or typically when our schools are open, we would have an expert in probably every couple of weeks to come and share their learning and um, share their knowledge around the curriculum um, content that we were delivering in that case study. And that was sort of taken away a little bit in terms of the closure. Um, so we got very creative with Twitter um, and very creative with the places that we would have had our visits to our fieldwork um, venues and asked them to create videos, question and answer sessions so that our curriculum was brought to life by real life experts. So for example, in our key stage one currently, they're doing a, um, an expedition about why we should care for our um, gardens and why that will then bring um, wildlife to our gardens and obviously endangered species, species then won't be endangered. Um, and um, so then our um, key stage one curriculum lead um, for this expedition contacted Sherwood Pines where we should have gone for a visit and got them to create some lovely little bite-sized clips that answered the children's questions about the different uh, mini beasts that they were studying and the different animals that they were studying um, and sort of it was very purposeful and very personalized so that then obviously increased the engagement and the excitement in our students to continue with that expedition. Yeah and just to add to that you know there are millions of people with PhDs around the world now who are, are wondering what to do with their days because they're not able to get into the labs or whatever and do research so we, we, we've tapped into that really and finding experts if anything at this point in time has been a little bit easier um, because you know they're online they're, they're, they're checking their emails and things so we, we've we've been able to tap into that really and you know this is an instance of a, a, a mitochondrial researcher um, who's looking at their role in heart attacks he was talking to our kids then again as part of the immersion as part of that you know getting the kids background knowledge and social equity 
Um, but if you are in a position where you've got an online platform set up or you've got an online presence, tap into that, you know, get on Twitter and get, get experts to talk to your kids about the stuff that they're learning because that they're begging out to share their expertise at the moment. So Claire, do you want to say a little bit about using kind of our, our websites to communicate with kids? And uh, Yeah, so uh, we sort of had a really good online presence in terms of blogging um, from a primary perspective in the, in the um, website use. So our teachers naturally celebrate and blog our curriculum online daily um, and share the amazing things that our children are doing. And so it, it just sort of continued naturally to continue to blog those things that our students are doing it, whether that be at home or at school. So we've got sort of a daily blog system going now where our, pet, our teaching staff are blogging the amazing learning that's happening at home as well as in school. Um, we're sort of continuing because of our small numbers in classes and because of the bubble system that we've termed cocoons, um, we can continue with that sort of expertise in the online curriculum alongside our in-school curriculum and it's sort of a blended approach which is really lovely um, and then we can give feedback through the google classroom like uh, martin said we celebrate in one place we um, set work in another place and, it, and our parents are very much aware and our children are very much aware of how that looks so we can give individual feedback class feedback and um, critique work through the google classroom and it's very personalized and bespoke to the students um, and then more publicly celebrate and then just, Neil, do you want to say a little bit about kind of this week and the trust that's been going out as well? Because that's a lovely way to end the week, isn't it? Yeah, so um, I think as, as, as the trust grown, as, as I mentioned to begin with, we've gone from three to six to possibly eight by September. Um, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm really passionate about is everyone believing and feeling what this trust is about. And although um, most of our schools, you can drive within 15 minutes of each other, Lots of different different contexts, uh, and every, everyone's obviously really busy. And we've been having this idea of that we want to have a, you know, um, like, well, and originally it was like a newsletter, um, an idea where we would just celebrate all the great stuff that's going on from our students who are three all the way up to all the way up to eighteen, um, celebrate the staff who work within our nursery kids all the way up to sixth form, um, but also kind of hit as many different stakeholders as possible. One of our big things was was our governors and directors, and while while they're really great and experts in their field, uh, we wanted them to know what was going on in our schools and the policies that they ratify and and the work that they do with us to feel it because sometimes people can't get into the schools. So I suppose this week in the trust was a we need to do it now, um, and um, let's not do it a newsletter. Let's just kind of create a, a really cool Google slide where the schools send into the comms team. The comms team work their magic, and then every every Friday by four o'clock, um, this amazing um, slideshow gets sent to everybody on our mailing list, um, all the stakeholders, all the families, all the all the kids, and all the teachers. And, and I, I can honestly say, until I get that on a Friday, my week's not finished. I sit down with a coffee about half past half past four, and, and look through this week in the trust and go, wow you know, and reflect about all the great stuff that we've done. Um, so, yeah, but it was, it, was, it was one of those ideas that we thought, well, that'd be a good idea. And it became a necessity to make sure we have all the trust knowing exactly what we're all doing together. And we were able to then post the next stage of the strategy on there to open up or um, ideas about the new, the new widening of the offer and what the safeguarding element will look like. So there was, there's some key information that gets put through there, but, predominantly is about celebrating and bringing the trust together yeah and, and you know that's part of our, our work in terms of making kids work public as well you know one of the bug hotels that you saw earlier with the turrets and things that was from a young lady who hadn't been engaging and if you can just celebrate a kid's work, work once really really publicly she's now on it she's on it and that's as a result of her doing a fabulous piece of work but that then being shared wider with the whole community and she's back on board now um, and, and you know as I've said that's a real driver for us in terms of making the kids work authentic by making it public uh, and, and again as I've mentioned earlier you know our crew leaders are doing an incredible job of checking in with kids as a wider crew once a week but in smaller groups and I, and I think that from my perspective certainly in secondary has been the biggest driver for the, 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 the increased engagement 
and for picking up those kids who were really, really struggling. Um, because you know, as teachers, we can put that academic work on there and we do our best to support them, but it's the crew leaders who know those kids and families best. And it, 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 they might act as kind of conduits to then arrange additional support for those kids. Um, but without that crew structure uh, and without us investing a lot of time in all of our schools and what it means to be crew, both through the staff induction and through the, the students induction, I don't think we'd be anywhere near where we're at at the moment. I don't, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that. Um, I think I just, it was really good for staff wellbeing as well. The introduction of hangouts for our students um, from a crew point of view enabled our staff to keep positive and keep happy and keep smiling because they were getting that instant feedback and there's a lot more feedback from a conversation isn't there and seeing someone face to face than there is through a tight conversation and just seeing the kids light up when they saw each other um, in itself as a parent of children in our school seeing my children on hangouts and how that uplifted their mood for the day was massive and so the hangouts has been probably the one thing that we will keep trying to continue throughout until we get all our students back in even if there are only a small number at home who are still wanting it because that's the thing that is giving everybody that uplifting feeling and and keeping mental well uh, well-being and health as a positive really uh, and then just in terms of trying to keep it simple and, and managing because again workload you know this perception out there um, in, in some places in the media especially that teachers haven't been doing anything for this time you know, our staff have never been busier and never been learning more about, you know, putting things online about the way that we do things differently. So, again, we've been trying our best to use technology to help us to reduce workload and investing front loading energy to make it easier at the back end. So um, we've really been able to harness the power of things like Google Suite to be able to have kids doing these online quizzes, have them be self-marking. And then as teachers and crew leaders, we then just need to review this and work out, OK, what is it that we need to do with each of these students? Uh, and you can see, you know, students are engaging with it. They're doing well on the whole. Um, but this then gives us a platform to do the really important work, which is to support those students who need it most. Um, and I think the big thing for me as a leader of a school was how do we keep this going? So we knew that the Hook Week would re-immerse a lot of our students because our students look forward to that Hook Week and the immersion of what are we going to learn this term. But how would we keep that going from one week to the next? Um, so Hook Week needed to be really exciting and as Martin said, something a bit different so that they all had a similar sort of um, starting point so we did lots of creative things lots of open-ended things lots of have fun with your family type things um, and there's just a few examples on there to share our um, EYFS students do things like um, a day of, in the life of a dinosaur um, and went out in their back gardens and created dinosaur lands um, key stage one students created fairy gardens none of this was anything revolutionary really but it got all the children excited about their new expedition and what they were going to be learning about and um, year five six were challenged to bake healthy um, foods and healthy things as part of their expedition um, and then year three four have got quite a difficult topic to teach um, from a distance learning point of view with it being all around the romans and uh, the roman settlements however the way they've approached that has got the children really engaged and their final product will be a website so it's kept them going in terms of it being hard content for them to learn at a distance um, but quite excitable content for them to learn from a distance because they can use little bite-sized clips they've created or little music clips they've created and insert them into a website so it's public um, as Martin said earlier. Um, and then the other big thing for me as a leader was how do we keep our staff going and our students going and not overwhelm them so as Martin said from a primary point of view some of this was very new and um, some of this hadn't been used so the things like Screencastify even Twitter in some respects, we'd not used from a primary school point of view massively and not optimised on the technology available. So we ensured that everybody in our school before we closed um, could access Google Classroom, could access Google Hangouts and could access our website for where the home learning during that period would be hosted. Um, and we just worked really hard for that first few weeks on getting everybody on um, and getting everybody working hard. Um, in terms of how to use Google Classroom. And that was for staff, students and parents alike. It wasn't sort of just pitched at one um, stakeholder as such. And then we've dripped in different things at different points. So as we went to 
um, Hook Week, and, Hook Week, sorry, and Immersion Week. Um, we added in lots of click view videos because the content is there and ready. So it's nothing massive in terms of an extra workload, but staff could learn a little new skill to add in. Um, and then obviously by getting our experts um, that I've already referred to, we could then use Screencastify to explain um, a little bit more around the content in week five and onwards. And as it's gone on, staff have become more confident in the way they develop their online curriculum, but also learn from each other. So we've got, I would say, a little expert in each phase that leads on different aspects. And so then they can roll it out um, within their phase with the other members of staff who aren't as confident and ensure it continues. Um, so yeah, I think our online learning as a staff team has been immense, um, but equally has been massively rewarding in terms of what we're getting back from students and parents and each other. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And it's been really analogous to kind of, you know, when we're training teachers as well, of, of not falling into that trap of, of having a smorgasbord of activities and going, uh, I want to run this activity without thinking about the learning. And this strategy in the primary, I think, is particularly smart and, smart and echoes back to that idea of purposeful use of technology. What is it that we want to do? And therefore, what are the platforms that we need to introduce at a specific point in time and not trying to do too much at once and overloading people? As an EdTech te team, we, we prioritised these platforms first so that staff could then drip feed these in. That's the end of that section. Are, are there any questions around the, the kind of move back towards expeditions? We had, uh, we had one question through, um, which you might have touched on a bit, but if there's any, uh, any other remarks. Um, generally, what are the things that you need to make an expedition work well for learning? And have you had to adjust any of those key elements as you've moved online? Uh, so for me, the, the constituent parts of an expedition, it, it's worth just going through those pretty quickly. We start with an immersion, which is, as I've said, it you know, comes from a position of social equity, but it's about building background knowledge. Then we'll move through a number of case studies, and this is where we're different to High Tech High. High Tech High start with the end in mind and go, what's a really cool project? What could the kids make? And what standards would fall out of that? Uh, expeditionary learning schools, EL Education in the US and ourselves, we start with the standards and we look about look at how can we combine these standards in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so we have these case studies and, and I think this is one of the misconceptions that, that people who come and visit our, our schools have is they hear project based learning and expect to come and see kids running around in a field with tambourines, you know, doing discovery learning all of the time. And it's not that, you know, during a case study, kids are learning about content from the national curriculum or GCSE standards but it's in context. And, and we're, one of the things for it to be successful in terms of the, 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 you know, the game that we all have to play in terms of out outcomes is you need to make sure that the content that we teach the kids doesn't exist in content silos. So I need to make sure in this expedition that I'm doing, the kids don't only, only know about the respiratory system of a night jar because that will be disastrous because air only flows through the lungs one way in a night jar. It's not a two-way system like it is in human lungs. So we have to do a bit of transfer but those constituent parts are really, really important, those case studies. That's where the learning lives. That's where you make it visceral. That's where you give kids lots of field work, lots of time with experts. And then at the end of an eight week expedition, for two weeks maybe, that's when the school looks most like high tech high and kids are working on these beautiful products at the end of the expedition. So I think for me, the most important thing in our context is being standards based and being absolutely clear on what is the learning that you want the students to do as a result of this expedition then you can con consider really, really cool projects that kids can do. Uh, and, and a thread running throughout that are these four T's of targets, which arise from the standards. Topic, what is it that we want the kids to study? What are the contexts that we're going to introduce to the kids? Um, where is this learning going to live? Text, there are anchor texts for even for a STEAM expedition where, like I say, we're learning about the night jar at the moment, but we're reading field notes from a catastrophe, looking at the wider impact of humans on ecosystems uh, uh, and then task what is it that you're going to get the kids to do at the end so targets topic text and ta task if you clear on those kind of tectonic plates then you've got a really really good expedition and my son wants to show me a comic that he's just drawn <laughs> i don't know if you want to add anything to that neil or claire yeah just just to kind of to, to look at the fact that i think one of, the, one of the great pieces of work that we did, again, prior to, uh, to uh, launching expeditions was our Chief Academic Officer, Andy Sprakes, who uh, works alongside Martin, 
to creating the school. Uh, he worked with every single teacher who wanted to to learn about how we can turn that expedition anatomy into online learning. So we were very fortunate that Andy was doing lots of hangouts with lots of phase teams, lots of teachers to try and get the the real clear view of what could immersion look like online? What could collaboration look like online? What could, um, you know, experts, how could we get experts in? So trying, again, just by talking through, because nobody was an expert in this. You know, we all had to just learn, learn by talking through the, the conundrums ourselves. But I think, again, a, a lot of that support from the, the, the wider capacity of the uh, executive team allowed our teachers to go, oh, yeah, that's a good idea, or, oh, yeah, we can do that. And then learning from each other, we, we were able to kind of uh, overcome those obstacles. I suppose the biggest challenge we've got is how do you do public celebration of our expeditions? Um, but I, I'll hand over to Claire, because she's probably got the solution to it. Um, so our two um, expeditions this term, um, we had already pitched to Andy, our Chief Academic Officer, um, prior to starting the expedition. Um, and one of them was a website and one of them was video. So actually, they've linked really well into our current situation. Um, so all of our learning has been done, either distance learning or with the students in school. Every child in Key Stage 1, every child in Year 3, 4 so far has contributed something um, to the final product. And as we enter sort of the end weeks in June, we are starting to create our final products and discuss with um, our comms team about how we can make that a little bit more public and share it to a wider audience, whether that be um, through hosting on other internet pages and um, other places of, uh, that we could, would have maybe visited um, as our hook um, and our field work and making those things public in different ways to what we possibly would have done typically in terms of a, a celebration or a launch of such where a lot of people would gather together. Yeah, and, and you know, in secondary context, similarly, we've just been making advantage of the online presence that we already had. So the, this study that we're doing of the night jars at Hatfield Moor, the original intention for us was our students were going to take their parents on the kind of dusk walk um, and guide them around the site and train them in how to listen for and how to spot the night jar. What we're doing now is asking those students who live closest to the moor until the fire uh, to go and get photographs, to go and get 360 photographs if they can do that on their phone. And we're putting together a virtual tour of the moor. Um, what, what our setting allows us to do is we're, we're really thinking carefully now about we've got an, a, an expert who's done a PhD studying the night jars at that site who's working with the students but we're now going to kind of change direction and look at the impact that humans have on that ecosystem specifically um, because best guesses at the moment are that the fire was caused by a barbecue so again there's a real visceral example of bringing the learning to life so that when we're talking to kids about conservation well they've got a real example there and you know, hopefully the learning that they're doing about bird watching. Um, each week when we do our closing circle, we play a game of spot the night jar because they have this extraordinary camouflage. We're teaching the kids to love this little bird so that they care about this site, so that they care about their planet. And you know, our, our, our habits of work and learning are work hard, get smart, be kind. But Ron Berger, who's the chief academic officer for expeditionary learning in the US, he, he put it to me, he was like, Martin, you know, you know it's not just those three things. We want our kids to work hard so that they get smart. But what's really important is we do that so that they can go out into the world and be kind. And, you know, and, and that's the imperative for our kids is what are you going to do to make your experience and everybody else's experience of school and of this planet better? Uh, and that's, that's why our school exists. Uh, and I think that's you know, the beauty of our curriculum is it allows us to do that. And as a trust, we've got structures in place to be agile enough to be able to do that during the course of an expedition. I'm starting to feel like I'm a bit of a jinx because we studied infection and response earlier in the air and COVID happened. Uh, and then we studied waterborne pathogens as part of that and the floods in Doncaster happened. So I'm going to just stop getting the kids <laughs> studying anything from this point onwards. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Martin. I'm just looking at the time. Um, I think we've got one more short bit left. Um, so we'll move on to that. We do have a question which we might come back to at the end if people need to shoot off. Um, but otherwise, uh, if we can move on, that'd be great. Okay, so in terms of the impact of what we did um, from secondary, and I'll, I'll go into this in, in a little bit more detail again, but we definitely saw real challenges in the first instance of just getting kids online, getting them engaged. Uh, and there was a turning point at Easter 
um, where expeditions restarted and where we mobilized crew leaders to get more involved in terms of being the, the point of contact. Um, but Neil, I, I don't know if you want to talk about these figures to start with. Yeah, just kind of, obviously we, we, we always wanted to kind of be mindful of um, our engagement and we talked as, as head teachers and the executive team about different ways to, to manage it and different ways to spot it. Obviously we had our uh, crew leaders and our class teachers and school mums and safeguarding leads. They were all over the, the, the first element, which is keeping our children safe. Uh, and through that, obviously, we got lots of information. We could we could then tackle any any issues that we had and remove those barriers, uh, which we've talked about for the whole presentation. And then through that, we just kind of wanted our our um, heads to kind of take some information about you know what does engagement look like. And uh, I think Claire is going to take us on the next couple of slides because um, you know as a head teacher, she's um, not that we have a league table, Claire, do we? But we we, we do challenge each other to. Uh, to, be, to, to have slightly higher figures than others? Yeah, um, I think as well from a head teacher point of view, it was really important for me to know we, we knew our kids were safe because we knew our safeguarding and the way we wrapped around our children was happening through hangouts, through crew conversations, through our safeguarding, our school mums doing the chasing up and checking that everybody was safe and well. But actually, we knew that learning was going to have a massive impact um, and potentially gaps would become wider as children were at home and not as engaged. So we want to check who was um, accessing things, who were the children that were engaging daily. So we've got now got to a place where around 83% of our children are engaging daily um, in some form of our online content. I've got to be honest, the majority of that is expedition, um, followed by math and then followed by English. English responses aren't as high, um, but our teachers have been quite clever in terms of trying to get their English content through their expedition slides as much as through their English. So we're trying to get workarounds for that. Um, and that's mainly because of us not knowing the final date of this and how much time we will have to narrow those gaps. Um, but one piece of work we've done is just to look at the hits on our website. So typically our hits on our website were pretty good we felt um, sort of 200, 300 a day. Um, but since May the 11, um, which um, was sort of the day we came back to um, launching our case studies, um, our case study two and case study three, and where we thought our engagement might slip, we've had over a thousand or 850, 860, um, a sort of the lower dips there below the line that are engaging our website daily. Um, and that's the number of people that are clicking into and looking beyond just the front page. Um, so that in itself has supported us to know that we are accessing uh, those parents at home and children at home and also people beyond that. So we've had comments from other schools in our local area that haven't got the online content that are saying, well, we're using you for our maths learning so we know they're keeping up to speed, um, which is really lovely to have that feedback. Yeah, and I, the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, cr crew leaders, um, as I've mentioned before, I've been integral to that and it was necessary, you know, it's like Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? It was necessary in the first instance to just make sure, are our kids safe? Are they being fed? Once we had that sorted and, and we were really clear that that was the priority from the, from the outset, once we had that sorted, that phase strategy made it clear to staff when we were getting, you know, 40% of kids accessing stuff at, at, at secondary, we had a plan and we were kind of saying to teachers, it's all right, it's all right. You know, once we've got the safeguarding stuff running and in a position where we're checking in on kids weekly and it's at a kind of st static level, we'll then relaunch expeditions. And we know from the way that we work that that will have the impact to, uh, that, that we desire. Yeah, so I think also uh, in these last couple of weeks now, we've, we've obviously started reflecting about, you know, how... how how we work and, and, and what has been our, our the learning on our trust. I think, again, it's really important to, to constantly reflect um, and celebrate where, where we have come from. I mean, we've, I think we've all got children who, ourselves, who go to different schools. I mean, I've got one of our, my children who go to one of our schools and one of our children who don't. So I've got a direct comp comparison there of, of how engaged uh, my children are based on the engagement of, of the schools. Um, so as we've as we've been working through these slides um, ourselves, we've been reflecting on what are the things that kind of have, have really have really accelerated. What are the things that we're going to kind of carry on if we ever get back to normal? Uh, and so the next couple of slides kind of you know 
narrate that. And so, Clara, you know, just going to lead us through in terms of students and then Martin will come in. Yeah, so I think for us, we will continue with the home learning uh, platform on our website to allow parents and students to know the direct ways in for things like the additional learning, the further study that we set, and it'd be a one port of call. Previously, we would do a homework menu alongside our expedition and some children would do it, some children wouldn't, whereas I think we'll maximise on the um, platform that's there and that's a really easy way to push out those extra places they could visit as a family once those places reopen. Um, and then maximising on the technology we've got available, so using the Google Classroom to share photographs and share learning experiences outside of school as well as sometimes inside school because we found that's been a way to allow children to collaborate really easily. Um, yeah, Sorry, Clara. Go From a staff perspective, you know, I just want to add that, you know, again, I'm, I'm so impressed with the, the, the journey of uh, that staff have come on, um, but we, we'll continue with the staff support centre. Um, one of the things that, that's been a, a key learning point for me is that, you know, we what our curriculum for the students, we have progress maps, which states, even at key stage three and key stage four, in the same way that the national curriculum does at key stage one and key stage two, says this is the immutable knowledge that we need kids to learn by the end of year seven. Um, and with respect, if your expeditions don't deliver that, you need to redesign your expeditions. Um, but we, we didn't have that. And because the nature of the work that we do is so different um, and, and this added difficulty of COVID has highlighted that even more, we didn't have a progress map for staff of in the time from June to July, because we, we appoint our staff early in the year, our new staff start with us on Monday. What are the immutable things that staff need to get from that? And it's been kind of a tacit knowledge that's never been written down. But more importantly than that, what is the knowledge that staff need from September in that first year because whether you're an NQT or whether you're just new to the trust there's an awful lot of learning to be done to be able to do these expeditions to plan them well and to be able to execute them well um, so using technology again to make all of that available so we're not the gatekeepers of knowledge but being really clear and having a map for that of this is the, you know it's like Donald Rumsfeld's known unknowns one of the things that we kept getting back from the induction was it's so different here, but if we'd just known about this at this point in time, that would have made things easier. So we're, we're going to make sure that all of our CPD for staff is available online, just in the same way that we would do for the kids. And, and, and this process has really accelerated the need for that. Sarah, do you want to jump in on that? I can do, yeah. Um, so we created parent support centres at um, both primary and secondary level to allow our parents a place to go to answer all those questions they had about the free school meal vouchers, about um, what our first of June plans would be for a potential return, um, where, how they could access all the online platforms and what that looked like. Um, and it's been a real go-to place for our parents. So that's something that we'll continue and use as sort of the place to host transition information to host information for students who are new to school and signpost people to use that to find out more about what it's like to be a parent at Green Top um, so that there's all the really easy access for them to every question they could have um, if they want to um, have that access. And again that, that website being a kind of a, a, a gateway to additional learning for parents again it's something that we talked about for a long time but it's now something that we just need to do is you know, once we've had meetings with parents and said, look, Haggerty Maths looks like this, this is just, and then they go, oh, okay, I get that now. You know, we must, when parents are able to come back into school from the outset of their time with us, especially in secondary, where they're coming from so many different primary settings across the whole borough, because our catchment is all of Doncaster, we need to have an induction for parents, which is where the kids will sit alongside them four or five weeks into the term and say, this is how I learn at home. This is how classroom works so that parents are aware. And again, to have that all available online so that we're not the gatekeepers of that knowledge either. Thank you. Yeah, guys, so to kind of summarise, um, I think our, what our learning has been is that we've, obviously as a, as a very young trust, we've, we've done an awful lot of learning in the last two years, but I think what we've realised is that if, if trust can create capacity uh, and leaders can keep their messages really simple and staff through caring remove the barriers, then simply children will just engage and I think again, we you know we're all about mantras and, and keeping it you know keeping it um, the language really simple. And I think that's where 
that's where we are. If 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 the trust can can write a diagram and, and draw a picture, and then the heads can interpret that and keep and, and keep the simple instructions. We know we we employ staff who love what they do, care for the children, and by that then they remove any barriers, be it free school meals, be it technology, be it internet, be it learning. You know that, that's what our, our staff will do, and then the children will engage, and it, it's been proven to be in the last twelve weeks. So. That, that summarises what you know what we've learned. Thank you very much. That was hugely, hugely informative um, and really, really interesting to listen to. Um, I'll just wrap up with a few closing remarks. Um, so, first of all, and, and certainly um, not least, thank you so much, um, XP. Um, that was really, really interesting to hear and, hear, and to hear how you've uh, planned for and adapted to COVID nineteen and how it's going well and how you're measuring that impact as well. Um, thank you also to all the attendees who've tuned in. Uh, I hope you found it um, as informative as I did. Um, we will we'll, we will link um, you to the recording. Uh, which we've been taking um, in case you want to refer back to this um, presentation as well as send across uh, the slides and any other documentation which has been referenced uh, within the presentation um, and likewise to the participants if you feel like your free school is doing something really well and you'd like to host one of these sessions uh, do let us know um, but going forwards um, to all groups involved um, do refer to our COVID-19 hub uh, on the website um, for continued support and uh, future events as well um, but again thank you very much to XB um, and I hope you'll have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys.